I'm so glad you have joined us tonight for Moment to Moment. I'm Amy Sass, Artistic Director, and um, I want to welcome you to this program. Uh, Moment to Moment is a live talk series exploring what can be learned, felt, and created at this time of global pandemic. Amid the disruption, illness, and uncertainty, we stop, slow down, and tune in. What might we hear? Before we begin, I want to thank each of you for being here tonight, and um, I want to acknowledge our tech team and have them introduce themselves. So Joshua, do you want to just let folks know what you're doing? Sure. Um, I'm Joshua. I'm Ensemble and Project Manager for Ragged Wing Ensemble, and I am going to be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. If you need technical help as well, I can help you and uh, put it in the chat. I'll try to help you out. Great, and then Sango Tajima, uh, please let us know what, what, your, what your role is tonight. Hey, Sango. Hi. <laughs> so there you are, great. I will be monitoring the Facebook Live video as soon as we get that up and running. So feel free great. to shoot me some comments as well. Great. Thank you, Sango. Um, I want to start with a few acknowledgments and intention setting as we hold this space together tonight. Um, I want to acknowledge that we are attending from different locations, physical locations, and different time zones. But no matter where we are, we all sit on Indigenous land. And the digital space that we are holding together is a privileged one in that some folks have access to it and some do not. And I'm bringing up that to our, the forefront of our minds so that we can make really good use of this time together um, because we tend to use digital spaces to multitask, to speed things up, to do rapid fire communication. But right now, I'd like us to start by doing the opposite. So I am a big fan of ceremony, and I want to begin by um, lighting this candle. And I'm going to light this candle to sort of open the conversation and to invite all of you with me to slow down and tap in. So I'm going to light the candle. And if everyone could just take a, a breath wherever you are, big full breath. And another one. And then allowing yourself to just kind of feel the surface that is supporting your body. In times of um, challenge, we tend to contract. And so if, as you breathe, if you can allow some spaciousness to enter into your body, your chest, your belly, and allow some calm to settle into your cells as we open this moment and tap into it and uh, hold this space together. So I wanna begin now with uh, introducing our topic for tonight. I'm so pleased to uh, have this program where we get to talk about the Forest Speaks About Dainu and What is Enough. And I'm going to be introducing our guest tonight, Joe Lamb, who is an arborist, poet, environmental activist, and filmmaker who lives in Berkeley with his wife, daughter, two dogs, one snake, and a redwood tree that has a sign 75 feet up made out of LED lights. And the sign says, hope. Joe, thank you so much for coming tonight. Oh my God, it's such a such a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Uh, and I 
I should start off with a caveat that I am uh, neither a rabbi nor a, nor the Lorax, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that I have that I have no privileged position to be talking about uh, uh, Dayenu, uh, and that there are people on this uh, feed right now who have a tremendous deep knowledge of it. But uh, I am a person who's been to many satyrs and who has a, a great deal of respect and affection for the uh for the passover story and for and for judaism in general and and it is a tale that speaks to the times that we're living in right now uh, uh we live in a time of political turmoil uh political oppression uh lots of pharaohs out there right now including one in the united states um and we also live in a time of of plagues uh, and so there's, there's much in this story that speaks to the moment that we're in now. And I've always loved Seder and I've always, one of the things that I've loved most about Seder is, is the part in it where you do say, uh, where it's a meditation on gratitude, where you're talking about it would have been enough. And, and I think that that whole question of what is enough, mm. uh, is, is one of the resonant things for our time. And so I'm really honored to be a participant in this conversation among all of us here, because I hope that it becomes a conversation among all of us uh, about that. And, and for us, uh, play- Yeah, I was gonna say, I'd love for you to tell me about uh, what I <laughs> what I have been thinking in my mind as the great inquiry of Joe Lamb, <laughs> and your and your relationship, your continual conversation with Forrest. Well, that, largely by by accident and by birth and just by serendipity, I've I've been able to spend my life with trees. Uh, I love trees. Uh, I make a living as an arborist. I, you know, got paid to be Peter Pan for, you know, thirty years and climb around in trees and and prune them and uh, you know glorious wonderful work and meeting glorious wonderful people from uh, many of them from Mexico and Guatemala, uh, you know people who people who dared great dangers to come to the United States to to work people who are you know I consider my family uh, and uh, and because of uh, because of that serendipity you know I I I do have a a loving relationship with trees. I uh, really appreciate trees. And I've been working as an arborist now for like 35 years, and I need to do it for a couple of hundred to really uh, understand the profession very well. Because one of the things that trees teach us is something about scale. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the oldest living single tree on the planet is around 6,000 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, the oldest living uh, uh, clonal tree, a tree that just pops back up from its roots after it dies, is a, is a I think it's a spruce tree, I'm not sure, it's either a spruce or a fir in, in, in I think, Norway, and it's around 9,000 years old. And then there's a communal clonal tree that is basically an entire forest that lives in, in Utah that's one individual, but it covers an entire forest. It's just reproduced from its roots, uh, and it is uh, in the range of 90,000 years old, that one individual. So, wow. so, so, so trees at that level are talking to all of us just through their being, just, you know, mm. who they are, uh, just by being present here on the planet mm. for anybody that wants to pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I remember in our initial conversation, you had started to talk about the connection between uh, this moment that we're in, this pandemic and pandemics in general, and deforestation and, and just trees. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that um, because uh, you know, when you mentioned it to me, I, I, was, I was really struck by, by that perspective, by that lens um, and connecting what we are going through as human beings to to plant life, so could you could you give a little bit of insight into that? Yeah, uh, um, yeah. It was in 2013. I was at a conference in in New York City, uh, and there were people there from uh, uh, I, I think it's called One Health, uh, 
who, who study pandemics, and they were talking about how, I mean, COVID, of course, hadn't, didn't exist during that time, but they were talking about all of the, the diseases that move from the forest interface back into human beings mm -hmm. as, as being diseases that are basically caused by our, uh, you know, tearing down a forest by deforestation. Uh, uh, SARS, Ebola, uh, MERS, there are many different zoonotic diseases that have moved from animals into humans. Uh, diseases that if, that, that if we weren't ripping out the forest would, would just exist as kind of viral things on a secondary host and wouldn't be a problem. Uh, but there's a lot of science that's out there now showing a, and you can go to the Borneo Project website. It's not up there yet, but there's going to be a page up there uh, in a, within a week or two that's going to list a whole bunch of articles that have come out uh, showing that deforestation is the main cause of pandemics, uh, of these kind of pandemics globally. And so I'm sorry to start it off on such a dark note, but, <laughs> but uh, if you know, we need to heal our relationship, our spiritual relationship, with nature in order to prevent these other pandemics from happening in the future. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to, as one of my hobby horses that I ride around all the time, the best way to do that, the best way to heal our relationship to forests and to protect the forest is to ensure full human rights for indigenous peoples around mm -hmm. the planet. That mm -hmm. that's, uh, uh, there's a, a lot, that's not just me as an arborist, you know, mm -hmm. activist uh, in California saying that, that's the Ford Foundation and uh, a lot of hard science saying that as well. Yeah, thank you for that. And I know that you, you have been a part of the Borneo Project. Can you just tell us a little bit of that, that work? Uh, yeah, I founded the Borneo Project, uh, gosh, it's uh, 27, 28 years ago. Uh, and it was originally the idea was uh, to do something about rainforest destruction in Borneo because there was very little known about it in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I went over there with the idea uh, that we were going to try to do something to protect the forest. But as, as soon as I got there, I, uh, it was immediately apparent that you can't separate the people from the forest mm -hmm. and that, that, that it's not a, uh, it's not an issue about protecting trees. It's an issue about protecting a really complicated ecosystem in which human beings are part of that ecosystem. And indigenous peoples around the planet have been uh, interacting with the world that they're, that they're in for, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of years. And in Borneo and in other places, they, uh, up until very recently, uh, have been able to maintain the most species diverse uh, ecosystems on the planet, uh, you know, places with huge amount of species abundance and a place with what anthropologists call primitive affluence. You know, they lived a very good life because the forest that was around them was so abundant. Mm. And it's only in, within my lifetime, uh, Borneo's gone from being covered 90% covered by forest, 98% covered by forest to down to like 30 or 40% covered by wow. forest. And, and that's happening so many other places on the planet simultaneously. But. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's really important work to, to get involved in. Joe, <laughs> really intense work, I imagine. And, you know, I, I remember in our conversation before you had talked about, what did I say? Oh, we were talking about zoonotic diseases. And this was a word that was, was unfamiliar to me. And I was like, zoonotic, I always learn something from you. And, and, I, and I had this, this moment where I said something like, I had I never was able to connect with sciences when I was growing up in school. And, and you had said, wait a minute, wait a minute science and nature are not the same thing. And, and you had talked about being um, a science teacher for a while back in the day, and that there was, there was something about the education around nature and science um, that, was, that, helped, that kind of helped elucidate this topic uh, that I'd like to dive into about what happens and how we end up uh, alienating ourselves from nature. So, uh, you know, if you can speak a little bit about, about that. 
Well, I, I just noticed that my best student from uh, the time when I was teaching biology in the distant past is uh, like there. Hi, Tom. Oh, great. <laughs> Fantastic. He's gone from being my student to being my teacher for many years. Uh, uh, he actually does really beautiful work in, uh, in New Mexico on uh, working with rural communities, getting them involved in conservation as, as an economically viable thing for, for uh, you know, like Hispanic communities out in the, out in the boondocks in New Mexico. He does really brilliant work there. Uh, uh, this Toner Mitchell at, working with, with Trout Unlimited. But but uh, so I have a I have a deep love relationship with nature and a very ambivalent relationship with science. I love science, but I think there's a confusion between what is science and what is nature. And we tend to think of like the natural world as being science when it's not. It's nature, and and scientists don't own nature. Uh, concepts about nature are are you know everybody has. Them. Indigenous peoples have, to my mind, highly evolved what could be called sciences, uh, which are also very deeply spiritual in some places and their medicinal work is tied in with it. A, a friend of mine who is a doctor worked with a trio people in the Amazon and he identified over uh, uh, 75 different diseases that they have very specific cures for mm -hmm. using their local herbal stuff. But it's not just the herbs, it's also the rituals around the herbs that are part of the healing thing. And there's this whole, you know, kind of deep uh, science, to my mind, uh, embedded in that. But I, I don't want to get sidetracked into, you know, my little diatribe about science. And religion. But, but I think <laughs> there's the same problem happens with religion, that people confuse religion with God. And I think that that's a real problem also. But... <laughs> I know. When we spoke about that, uh, you know, you, you you sort of you were you were worried about well not worried you just were kind of aware of the potential controversy of that statement and um and and I think it's a, I think it's a a really interesting statement you had made about science and then sort of the analogy with with religion which is like the way that I heard it was that science is a language to talk about nature. And that religion is a language to talk about God, which yeah. some people might consider nature, yeah. right? Or, or intricately linked to nature. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's really interesting, this notion of um, the languages we create to speak about what is, right? What is and what we are experiencing as human beings. And so I think, what what I'd like to do right now is just I'm curious to know how this moment speaks to you, Joe. Well, I'm I'm going to 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 be a uh, be a philosopher and all and kind of bounce that question back. Oh, uh, great! Because I because I, I'm a big fan of Ragged Wing and and one of the one of the reasons I like Ragged Wing so much yeah. is that as a theater, you, you integrate all of these spiritual mythic things into, into the theater as kind of a practice where instead of it just giving answers, it like uncovers really interesting questions. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's part of what we need to do at this time and part of why I love uh, why I love the whole Passover Seder thing about, about what is enough, that you're mm -hmm. simplifying, going down to like, what is, what is the essential thing? You know, what, what underneath are, are the things that, 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 that really, uh, what is enough? Uh, and I think that you guys asked that question very brilliantly about time, which is mm -hmm. another thing that we consume in time sensitive, uh, mm -hmm. And so I'd just like you to riff on that for just a minute. I've been Oh, great. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so yeah, what is enough in this moment? I mean, I do think that in, to me, I, d I do feel like this moment has two forces. Well, time is a big, is a big um, topic for me. And I, I think it is also a, uh, it's a political topic because, you know, how we use our time, who controls our time. I think about Passover and um, our, our family is doing a, 
what I have called the, uh, <laughs> the uh, unconventional Zoom Passover experience. <laughs> and, uh, and, and as I've been looking through, I've been trying to take the Passover story and sort of like actually divide it up into acts and like, you know, as I've been doing some research into that, I've been thinking about, you know, slavery and like, what is it that we are um, enslaved by right now? And um, one of the things I think about is, is time and our, our expectations of time and our, you know, attachment to being on time, getting things done on time, productivity um, and speed. And in this moment, I feel, um, that there are two forces. There's this, this energy moving through me that is participate, act, like do something. Like what can you do in this moment to uh, bring something positive to the world, right? That, that's like this energy and like there, do it quickly. Like there is no time to waste. Like let's not waste our time, right? So I have that energy moving through me. And then I have this other energy that is happening at the same moment, which is, is this feeling of, is this really a moment to do? Is this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> my mom is on here right now. So mom, <laughs> this is because of you. <laughs> but my mom used to say to me all the time, Amy, you are a human being, not a human doing. And I mean, I've been hearing that since I was a teenager. And of course, when I was a teen, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, I mean, I hear that all the time. And I feel like it has become my, <laughs> my philosophy of human being versus human doing and how I assess my, um, how I assess my, my or, or validate my, my existence, my consumptive existence <laughs> on, on this plane. And so I think about these trees, you know, when we, we started to pull together these images, these promo, you know, and, and you sent me images of trees, right? And I, you and the trees, and where the trees were actually the main character. And, um, and I thought, you know, these trees you've been talking about, the scale of time with those trees and just how long they've been there and that stillness, like what it is to be still to my eyes, but deeply effective, right? And this notion of the forests and, their, and, and what they are doing, this invisible thing they're doing that we can't, we don't necessarily see, right? Um, so my thought, you know, today at this moment talking to you is about one of the things I like to do is turn my lens from Amy human, human beings to another species. If you look at the, another species and you make that the main character, what does that voice say? So that, that's where I am right now. And that's, that's sometimes how I begin to make art or come, art is just, again, like what you were saying, it's a language to talk about what is, just like religious, religion is a language to talk about what is, and science is a language to talk about what is. So that for me is my language to talk about what is. So that's, that's my answer, that's my riff. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. So um, I'd love to, Joe, do you have a riff on my riff? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to riff on your riff for just Please riff on my riff. So, riff away. <laughs> so, so I'd like to, uh, once again, just thank the, thank the arts and the arts in general and theater arts and painting for, for allowing us to consider paradox and to hold, hold different truths simultaneously, even truths that seem like they're in conflict with each other. And, mm -hmm. and that one truth about, about the need for action and the need for stillness. I think are both very beautiful things. And uh, and two friends of mine that I've been interacting with around this, asking them for information, you know, for their thoughts about it. I don't know if they're on the, the, the feed now or not, but it, one, is my, one is my friend, uh, Martin Wagner, who's uh, uh, been talking about uh, silence and pleasure uh, and the importance of that, uh, uh, the spiritual importance of that as part of what it is that's enough. Uh, 
Mm. And, and so there's so there's that. And then my other and then another friend of mine, Phil, who started this organization that you can go to uh, called Dayanu.org, where he is, on the other hand, uh, enough with an exclamation mark after it, you know, a call to activism, a call to to, to Jewish people around the world uh, to, to marshal their faith in defense of the of the world now in the time of climate change. And mm. I think that those two points of view are, are, are not in conflict with each other. I, I think that they're very much complementary. Uh, and, and I, uh, my wife, Anna Goldstein, who's also on the feed here is, you know, working a lot on that concept of resilience and the concept of centering, uh, you know, as is my friend Yael. Hi, Yael, who's also uh, on, the, on this feed here as well. Um, Great. But, 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 but I think that both of those points of view are, 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 are critical and important. So I want, I want to get to comments and questions in a moment from, from all these fantastic folks on here with us. Um, but before we do that, can you just tell me a little bit how silence and pleasure emerge in your life at this time? Um, so, so when things get, when things get really uh, dark for me, uh, and I feel that it's just, you know, all of the pain of the world is filtering into my unconscious, uh, I mean, I, I firmly believe what James Hillman, the great union psychiatrist, said that that the uh, that the state of the world comes into us whether whether we acknowledge it consciously or not. That it's uh, all of this knowledge about suffering is loose inside of our being, looking for someplace something to do, uh, and that so I, I I feel that in me. I think I am, uh, uh, you know, I have a fairly good awareness of that. And and what I just love doing is just walking around and looking. Uh, very closely at things, which once again, I think comes back to the concept of, of Dianu, you know, what is enough? And for me, just walk, and this sounds kind of silly, I, I, I suffer from what be, might be called the ecstatic dilemma, that, that the world just seems unbearably beautiful to me. Mm. Uh, and, and just walking around in Berkeley in the rain, looking at the way raindrops hang on, on pebbles or, um, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's so gorgeous everywhere around me uh, mm -hmm. that, that I just go out and try to let that uh, reset my consciousness because it's so easy to allow the fear and the anxiety to, to, to sort of swamp the other reality about how we live in this cornucopia of, of beauty. I mean, today in line, I was standing in line with people six feet apart, everybody wearing masks, you know, it kind of looks like this horrifying thing. And we're at Acme Bread to go in and get these beautiful pastries and, you know, cheese rolls and stuff. And so, you know, there's this weird discontinuity where this, this absolute abundance at the same time that there's this, this pervasive uh, fear. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it kind of also made me think of um, just that act of filtering. The act of filtering. I mean, isn't that a tree act? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I don't know that much about trees, really. I mean, I love trees, you know, but I don't know that much about them. I mean, no, but they, they, they filter pollutants out of the air. That's one of the horrors about the fires that are happening at Chernobyl now is that they've taken all this radiation and stored it in their flesh. The same way that street trees take all of the pollutants and store it in their bodies, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, take it away from, uh, take it away from us. Uh, uh, yeah, they're they're constantly filtering, and, and and one other quick riff that I just want to make sure, sure to get in is it is about the to me the one of the most interesting questions that trees ask about what is enough is not just what is enough for the individual, but what is enough for whom, you mm -hmm. know that to me that's a whole other question that's involved there, and trees people have been discovering recently in the last ten or fifteen years have these elaborate systems where they're joined uh, in their roots and their, these mycelial fungal connections underground. And that uh, if a tree is in distress, another tree that has nutrients will send, tree, send its nutrients to that, to that tree that's in distress. And, wow. and, and, and in the ancient forests in the Pacific Northwest, 
there are these trees that are called grandmother trees that are these gigantic trees. And when they start going into decline, the foresters would always go in and remove the grandmother trees. But then this, there was a woman scientist, and I'm sorry that I've forgotten her name, did all this research and discovered that that's a really bad idea because those trees, when they go into decline, know that they're dying. And in the act of dying, they transport all their nutrients back out to the rest of the trees in the forest. Uh, to sustain them. I mean, that is just absolutely fantastic, right? I mean, can we, can we learn, can we, can we, our, can our behavior learn from these trees? Can we, can we do as trees do? Can we, um, how, how, how can we in, make ourselves a vehicle of filtering, right? How can we make ourselves a, a, that generosity of passing on nutrients, right? To and ignore and like being aware of of who's in need and, and if we have to to offer, right? I think that is, um, I mean, Joe. One of the reasons why I invited you on this program is because I always learn something, <laughs> something I didn't know, <laughs> and I, I think that that's a you know, thank you for teaching me every time we talk. I want to right now open up to um, to the folks who've joined us today who who probably have lots of interesting knowledge and things to say at this moment. And um, I'm ready to take some comments. So Joshua, if you want, Joshua and Sango, if you want to help us uh, take these comments and, and questions, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I just posted in the chat, um, everyone is able to unmute themselves. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a, a question, um, the other way you could do it is just post it in the chat and uh, Sango or I will voice for you. I can ask a question. It's a very big question, actually, but I'm in. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm interested in this paradoxical, the paradoxical energies of doing and being. And I was so happy to hear you, Joe, take it into the realm of paradox, I think, because as human beings, the more we can sort of develop the capacity to hold and be with paradox. I think paradox is kind of in the nature of, of all, all things. And um, a lot of times we wanna make things one or the other. That's our, our sort of cultural tendency, but can we develop our capacity to hold both and or do be? And I'm wondering if you or anyone else on the call has a way of developing those capacities in the context of this moment. Right, like, how do we, how do I, or we go beyond the, the, just the concept of the doobie paradox into kind of a lived balance or something? Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, MK. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, do we have any ideas out there? I'd ask Yael. Yael, what's your idea on that? No. <laughs> so, so uh, I'd also like to punt to Anna Goldstein, who does a lot of work on resilience and activism simultaneously. But if she doesn't want to come on, she shouldn't feel like she has to. But, mm -hmm. but I think that she models that. But by on the one hand, being a, a super kick-ass activist out there. You know, slugging it out, trying to trying to stop the oil companies from taking over the planet, and then on the other hand, really working on a on trying to remain centered and, and not let that just spin her off into outer space. Mm. I think she does a great job of like uh, like balancing both of those things. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everybody. Hi, um, I. I, I, Joe can't, you can't call people in like that. It's, it's, it's <laughs> I just cheap. did. <laughs> I, know, I know. I just want to flag that's that, that not best practice. But, um, what I'd say is, um, I think that I really appreciate that question, MK. And I think that it is counter to the way we're trained and enculturated in, um, patriarchy and capitalism. And uh, I think that for me, having a mindfulness practice where, mm -hmm. where 
I hope to be more attentive of each moment and hope to be less attached to the continuation of any particular thread that I know that the only thing that's real is change. The only thing that's inevitable is, is uh, flux or flow or, or a diversity of emotions. And so that helps me release some of my attachment to like it's good versus it's bad or it's mm -hmm. X versus it's Y. So I can, I can have more spaciousness for paradox Mm. Um, and more generosity for a diversity of experiences or emotions in myself and in others, you know, and I try and I guess one thing I do is I try and say, instead of say like, you know, how are you feeling and asking or expecting one word, whether I'm checking in with myself or with you, I might be like, what are the 11 different things that you're feeling right now? You know, that, that, that it's not mutually exclusive that you would be happy and sad or excited and bored or uh, confused and yet grounded. So um, that one, one thing. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> Thanks for the best practices. Check. <laughs> check <laughs> i appreciate okay. that can i jump in one thing on that please um it was just reminding me of a conversation we had actually in our staff meeting a couple weeks ago about um viewpoints and and kind of artist training practices and how um you know viewpoints is, is a is a type of, of kind of a practice for for actors and for theater makers and some of the principles are things like kinesthetic response um spatial relationships and it's it's basically like it's it's this um, amazing kind of uh, confluence of do and be where like you're constantly in motion you're constantly doing but you're not like deciding and making plans you're you're, you're responding to the moment at every given moment um, and it was just kind of interesting to think about kind of and then there's this sort of little manifesto that I saw being passed around called um, this is what we train for it was like for artists in this moment like as artists like this this way of kind of constantly being um, kind of going out and going in and going out and going in and, and um, training for like responding to the world um, you know while, while being active and 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 also not like over determining it so mm -hmm. this little nugget to add thanks Anna thank you I've been thinking about what while, while this while these this conversation has been rolling the thing that I keep and I mean I keep I'm trying to imagine myself Amy like if you were a tree dot 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 right um, and the, the thing that, <laughs> because I don't know, if, if I was a tree, you know, what is that? And I actually, I, I, practice, I practice yoga and I have always found tree pose really difficult. Um, like I just, I think it's really hard. Uh, I can do all kinds of other things, but that particular pose, just the stillness of that, the balance of that, the asymmetry of it, I have found so, uh, it's just like it continues to reveal uh, imbalance. <laughs> like basically, it's a, it's the study of imbalance. That's the that's how I feel. That's what I feel like I'm learning from it. Um, and when I'm in tree pose, I I have tried different different types of what I have tried to do is change my eyes, like. Mm changing my eyes from to facing forward changing my eyes to looking to the right to the left looking up and and just changing where my gaze is is reveals so much about whether i'm connected to the ground or not like i mean <laughs> you know i just look to the right and i fall down or i i look up or i fall down or, or you know the the really hard one is closing my eyes and like that's where I can't even balance with my eyes closed. And I've been thinking about um, uh, let's see. being a tree, you know, this, this notion of tree pose and how, how challenging it is to remain, to just remain, to just hold. Mm. And, then, uh, and then to feel and how challenging that is. And I've thought, I, I think about seeds because in really dark times in my life and 
dark, you know, dark times in, in my, in the life of my family, I have noticed that that stillness is not actually in action. Stillness is, I mean, seeds, you put them underground, you can't see them anymore, but like they're doing all this stuff and there's like chemical processes occurring, right? Like heat and light is like making stuff grow, but we don't see it until it reaches the surface. So, so I, I think that there's um, something interesting to me about uh, the activity and the athleticism of being. Any thoughts or comments? If no one else hops on, please do hop sure. on. But, but I, I, I want to take the, the how much is enough and extend it in a, uh, another direction for just a second. Sure. Uh, it's good to extend it to like how much is enough for whom, asking that question. But I think it's also good to think of it not just in terms of limiting what it is that you have, but maybe you don't have enough. Uh, like, for instance, you know, asking the question, uh, how much rainforest is enough? Or uh, how many birds uh, uh, on the planet is enough? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how many insects, how many predators? I mean, you know, we live in a, in my lifetime, 50% of the world's wildlife has, has vanished by numbers mm -hmm. in my lifetime. And, and it's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's just to me a, a staggering thing. You know, it's like, talk about biblical, we become the anti-Noah in some, in mm -hmm. some sense. Uh, and, and, and so I think, it's, I think it's good to take that concept of what is enough and, and, uh, and, and play with it in, in a whole bunch of different directions because it's so, so resonant. Like, like how, much, uh, how much compassion is enough compassion? You know, how, how, much, uh, how much concern for the other, how, however it is that you configure the other, uh, is enough. Um, yeah, uh, and I think that you know we're letting we're letting the 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 favorite du jour uh, you know set the bar on compassion so low uh, you know that it's almost as if it's almost as if compassion itself is becoming a really radical act you know uh, revolutionary act. But. Yeah. Oh, the notion of revolutionary comp compassion and like the expanding capacity for compassion. And I mean, what's interesting to me about that is, you know, of course we run into that paradox again of like expanding. Well, I think about expansion. I think about contraction. I think about this, the way in which we open and then moments where we have to like pull in. Right. And, and that notion of, um, you know, uh, working in, activism i'm sure this is this becomes you know part of or you know the healthcare workers or any caregivers really this notion of um uh giving and then also having having uh allowing yourself to just pause to and rest right and the the boundary around that and being able to play and be fluid with um with have I given enough? Because I think that sometimes there is like, what is enough, right? Like what we have, what we consume, but then there's also like, have I given enough, right? And some of us are over givers, right? And then there's this like challenge about like, um, you know, and it brings me back to what you were saying before, Joe, about pleasure, mm -hmm. right? And like the pleasure of giving mm -hmm. and the, the pleasure of receiving. So that, that, that uh, you know, is there, is there a practice around identifying, am I in my pleasure space right now? And how does that let me know what is enough? You know, where is the sweet spot? Amy, I wanted to bring up um, a few people who are speaking in the chat here. Great, right. um, please do. And uh, we had a few comments um, from someone who is, uh, uh, dialing in with a number ending in 820. For work today, I went to a landscape dominated by beavers upstream of a town 
becoming a city that needs water. Beavers have no idea what they're doing, but the landscape does. Back of the napkin calculation, I and a Department of Game and Fish professional calculated 20 acres feet of water. That's a metric that cities understand, but landscapes understand it on a much deeper level. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know much about beavers and landscapes, but it sounds like there's, there's a strong relationship between these two forces. Um, and I, I would love to hear more. If, if um, Joe, do you, do you know more about that stuff? Well, I, I know a little about it, but, but tell me, tell me what you know. But Toner, the person who said it, knows a lot more. I think he oh, had, he yeah. had a riff for a second. Go ahead. Um, it, I don't know. I, I don't know how to fit it into this conversation, uh -huh. but uh, uh, I was out there with a, a several game and fish professionals and we were all standing about 15 feet away from each other and we were uh, grappling with an issue of watershed restoration and um, and we were seeing in front of us um, the results of beavers raising the water table of a flat a gradient meadow in a mm -hmm. high mountain environment. And um, I guess I only brought that up because I thought, oh, oh my God, this is, this is what I do for a living. And, and we are um, trying to put water into the ground upstream of a town that is in perpetual, well, uh, New Mexico is always in perpetual need of water, but but we're uphill from a from a town that needs perpetual water, and these beavers were doing this stuff, um, oblivious to everything, mm -hmm. and and I always in my conversations with Joe, um, we we go back to things like aspens, and and that organism in Utah, that. Joe, is it 9,000 years old? Yeah, 90,000, I think, 80, 90,000. 80, yeah. 90,000 years old. So, so we have these in, incredibly old uh, um, uh, ecosystems. But, but the one, one thing that's really clear is that beavers prefer the genus of tree that aspens are a member of, cottonwoods, mm -hmm birches, um, poplars, um, you know, Joe, what's the genus of, of cottonwood? Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a populus too, isn't it? Uh, populus, right. Yeah. So, yeah. so beavers, beavers prefer that, but, but as I've been doing this more and more in New Mexico, um, beavers are trying to chew on everything because there are other trees that are going away. Mm. Uh, beavers are chewing on invasive trees like Russian olives, mm. uh, you know, and other trees, but they're trying to do what they do best, which is, you know, spread water across floodplains, um, deepen uh, water tables, mm. all that kind of stuff. So I, I don't know why I put up that comment, but. But that's what I did today, and I'm so glad that I'm participating in this chat today because it, it's so um, it it helps me ground what I what I was doing today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You go, Joe. <laughs> so so a, a quick riff on that, and and uh, uh, and a quick riff on anthropomorphism uh, for, for just a second. Uh, I, I'm one of those people that believe that intentionality exists in other creatures and that, that, uh, that human beings aren't the only conscious beings on the planet. And I like the fact that you started off by, by saying, what does the landscape want? Be because to me, that is not, uh, uh, I think that's a good question. I, I, think, uh, I, I think that if you look at the concept of what is enough, that, that creatures in the wild, that's one of the things that they spend most of their time uh, 
dealing with. And if you want to think of it as thought or if you, however you want to think of it, uh, an animal can't waste energy hunting if that hunting is not working. So it knows how much it's supposed to hunt. It knows when it's enough hunting. Uh, and there's just lots of, lots of minute day-to-day, uh, -day, minute to minute decisions that are made by creatures in the wild uh, about what is enough uh, uh, and what is too much. Uh, and to me, that's not anthropomorphic. To, to, to me, I, I think that uh, I think that one of the things that our society suffers from, there's a very interesting book that's been published recently that, that says that, that throughout most of human history, people viewed themselves as being part of nature and that it's only within a very recent narrow window in time that people have viewed themselves as somehow being separate from nature. Uh, you know, of our 200,000 years that we've been here as, as homo sapiens, you know, the vast majority of that, we viewed ourselves as being part of nature. And a lot of cultures on the planet today still view themselves as part of nature. But those of us in our Western tradition have been taught since we were little kids that we are separate from nature. Uh, I don't want to derail the conversation with that, but yes, yes sir. No, that's, uh, that's not derailing it at all. I think that's right on. <laughs> And I, I, you know, I, I'm watching this chat go by. I'm actually very new to Zoom, so even so, watching the chat is 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 very <clears throat> surprising and interesting to me. Um, and I've been seeing folks talking about how we are we are the beavers, we are the land, we are the town. We, you know, um, we 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 can be all of those things. Um, and I just think that's it's it's interesting to to find that connection between what we are experiencing right now and and which what you know what purpose in this moment are we are we trying to serve? Um, Joe, for some reason, this keeps coming up in my mind, and I don't really know why. It kind of feels out of left field, but but here it is. You know, last time we talked, uh, the first time we talked you had talked about, I had asked you like, how, how is this moment, you know, shaking out for you? And you had said um, that you were processing it through the sensuality of cooking. Yeah. And I, w I wanted to hear a little bit more about that because we've been talking a little bit about like, um, you know, practices of filtering, right? Yeah. And we've been talking about uh, pleasure and, and taking space and time for pleasure and how, where, how pleasure um, emerges at this moment. And so, you know, if you could speak a little bit about what you meant by that, about that practice of, the sensu of indulging in the sensuality of cooking, um, well, I would love to, to hear. So that's the other thing that I, that I really like doing, or one of the other things uh, that I really like doing if I'm, if I'm feeling disconnected is to just get, get lost in, in cooking things that I, uh, that I love to cook. Uh, red chili enchiladas is one of them. And I, and I ritualize it to make it really uh, complicated to where you, you have to toast the red chili ahead of time and then and, and, uh, do all of this stuff where you soak it in. I soak it in a mixture of boiling wine and, and, and hot water. And, uh, and then there's all these different elaborate steps that uh, I go through to, to make it. And there's just something about the sensuality of the pepper when you've opened it up and you've toasted it. And, and like, I'll put it on the windowsill for a second so that the light can shine through it. And it looks kind of like stained glass. And, and just the, just coming back to the, to the, uh, the smell of the garlic and 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 just the you know the, the 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 layers of the onion all of that just seems so oddly uh, miraculous to me which is another thing that ties it back into the Seder event which is one of the mm -hmm. things I like so much in the Seder event is when you like taste the uh, taste the herbs and taste the salt and there has been science that showed that you're you your tasting actually increases dramatically if you ritualize your cooking and you ritualize the, the meal that you're having. You, mm -hmm. you, you, you appreciate it differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's something to me about, uh, my friend Martin sent me this thing about apocalypse and how apocalypse 
the, the meaning of the word apocalypse means to uncover. And, and, and there's something about disaster being kind of an uncovering of what is essential. And then a return to the simplest things it is, it is so grounding, just the beauty of the simplest uh, things. Uh, I, is that too woo? Is that uh, no. sensuality of cooking, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I, just I, the tactileness, the smelling, you know, the uh, way it looks, uh, just all of that. It's absolutely, just, it's like a, it's a well, and here we are, you know, um, you know, talking about this Passover seder, this ritual uh, that you know is all about connecting food to uh, history and story and oral storytelling. Um, I, I wanted to, we're, we're kind of closing in towards six o'clock right now, and I want to um, m move into, do we, well, before I do, just a check on if we have any other burning questions or comments. Um, Joshua, do you see any on the chat? Yes, there was one from Peter Montgomery um, right. that maybe we want to put voice as well. Um, it said, <laughs> Joe, trees can likely survive under much greater ra radioactivity levels than we currently have, yet humans might not. Conversely, if we flood valleys of trees for reservoirs, the trees die, but the people could move to higher ground. Could you rank the following energy sources by your preference? Those are coal, natural gas, nuclear, solar, wind, and hydroelectric. And uh, the caveat was also put. I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that question. <laughs> Peter, it's a great question. Uh, I'd, and, and not to be glib, but i just start off by saying solar, wind, and, uh, and actually hydroelectric, if it's, if it's micro hydro. We, uh, at the Borneo Project, we fought a lot against these big mega dams, which are hugely destructive, but there are ways that you can get uh, energy from streams in ways that are not destructive, mm. but but the other energy source that I think has to be has to be looked at in all of these is the question of how much is enough. That once again it comes back to uh, Dayenu, because there's uh, the the greatest uh, yield per research dollar is in efficiency, whereas the uh, and it gets almost no research and development money, just a teeny amount of research and development money. But a huge amount of research and development money goes into nuclear, which actually has a, a very small yield of energy per amount of money that's spent into it. And, and so I think that looking at just how much energy we actually really do need and how much we can use in a much more efficient way and how can we do it in a system uh, that's not destructive to the planet. I, I think that those then answer all those, that all those questions are actually a answered by a, a close enough look at ecology and, and economics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Okay. So I'm going to actually shift gears for a moment. And um, what I like to do at as we near the end of these these sessions is to offer a creative assignment for those who are interested um, and joe this creative assignment has emerged because of you so um, <laughs> the creative assignment that i it's, it's sort of an invitation to just um just try something new in whatever way you like um, and then also there's like a secondary invitation, which is if you're excited about documenting it and you want to send us photos or any kind of documentation, we'd be thrilled and we would post it and we would love to be in that kind of conversation with, with any of you um, on that because it's, it's, it's lovely to see uh, the, the conversation that exists in this space continue forward through creative activity. So uh, this assignment is, um, the question that's sort of prompting the assignment is what are the smells, flavors, and textures of connection? Mm. Mm. And I would call it an eating meditation. <laughs> <laughs> so the assignment is to create a ritual meal that generates those sensations for yourself, 
and or others if you choose. Um, and to the invitation is to, to take this notion of slowness and nourishment and to, to really gift yourself with, uh, with the process of, of creating the meal, the attention to the, the smells, the flavors, the textures, the, the appearance of, of the ingredients, and then also to eat the meal slowly with full attention, um, as opposed to it being a secondary thing that we do while we try to like either do other things or you know have lots of conversation, but just kind of give the meal the full attention. Um, and then to tune into the sensory experience. That's basically the assignment. Um, and I think that, you know, that's inspired by your, you know, the, the pleasure, the sensual experience of cooking. <laughs> um, and I want to close out this, this evening uh, with, with thanking you, Joe, for bringing your, your thoughts and your, your, um, your story, your inquiry to us tonight. Um, Thank you. I want to, yeah. <laughs> I want to carry this uh, idea of what is enough forward and to continue to, for my own self, to continue to think about that and um, just have that be a little bit higher up in my thought process of uh, what, what is enough? Like, what, what do I truly need right now? What, what can I truly offer right now? What is the space of pleasure for me in this moment? Um, how can... I look at the lens through a perspective that's not my own um, and maybe not my species. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wanna thank my tech team. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Sango. And I wanna also just let you know about a couple of pieces of information here. So for, for information about forests and pandemics, uh, please go to the borneoproject.org. Uh, I know that Josh was listing these things in the um, in the chats, and they will also be in the survey at the end of this. Joe also has a book that is out. It's a book of poetry. Joe is an incredible poet, actually. Um, I have one of your poems about ginkgo trees hanging up in my art studio, just so you know. Um, and so the book is called Hold Fast, and uh, we're, we're putting in the information right now into the chat about where you can purchase hold fast. Um, and let's see, oh, one other thing. So we, we do have a survey we would love for you to fill out so that we can connect with you and grow this program. Um, and if you have interests, uh, if you wanna nominate yourself as a speaker, we got one of those last week, which I, I'm going to be following up on. Um, <laughs> that would be great. I'm really open to having guests and, and perspectives uh, in this space. So please fill out our survey so we can, we can continue this conversation. Um, and lastly, I would love if folks might consider a donation to Ragged Wing Ensemble. This is a time of great transition for our organization and we would love to be able to keep uh, programs like this alive and accessible. Um, so consider a donation. You can donate at raggedwing.org. So What's before- What's next we week? What was that, Keith? What's next week? Next week, thank you, Keith. Next week, I love it when I get a great prompt here. Um, next week, next Thursday, we have another uh, we have another segment. It will be at five o'clock Pacific time. The topic will be called is called befriending darkness with the urban love monk, who is actually here tonight. But I won't reveal. <laughs> I won't reveal. <laughs> She's here tonight. Um, her name is M.K. Nelson. Uh, she is a writer, spiritual director, and hospice educator. And we will be discussing unlocking grief, how to hold yourself in moments of loss, and the power of curiosity. So I may each of you be well and healthy. Thank you for coming. And I will see you next week on Moment to Moment. Thank you guys. Thanks, Thanks Amy. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Amy. It's, it's Thank, you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. See you later. Thank you. <laughs>